You may be seated. Good morning. If you're visiting with us for the first time today, I'd like to introduce myself as Pastor Nathan. I have the pleasure of serving as one of the pastors here at Cornerstone Church. Uh, and if you would, if you would fill out the connect card located in the seat in front of you, and you can return it to the kiosk in the back, and when you do, we'll have a, a gift for you to say thank you for being our special guest today. We are in the second part of our Christmas series called He Will Be Called. And this is coming from a verse in Isaiah chapter 9, and it's verse 6 there. And this is Isaiah prophesying about the coming Savior of the world. He has prophesied 700 years before Jesus would be born, which is what we celebrate at Christmas. But here's what Isaiah said. He said, a child is born to us. A son is given to us. The government will rest on his shoulders and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, which is the one we looked at last week, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Last week we looked at Wonderful Counselor and we talked about that, that he is our Wonderful Counselor that counsels us during our time of need. And let's see who can remember the word that we're supposed to do in response to him. We should what? We should... Listen, I heard a few people say it. I'm going to start testing you on Sunday mornings. <laughs> See if you're listening from the previous week. We should listen to him. This week we're talking about Jesus as our mighty God. And there's some misconceptions about Jesus. Some people view Jesus just as this mighty man that walked this earth, that taught some good teachings, some good moral teachings. Uh, they think that he was just a good guy, basically. But Jesus was God. And if you don't view him as God, if you just view him as this mighty man, then you don't follow him as God. But then this is probably one that we struggle with more. I believe people here today, I hope that you believe Jesus is God. But I think some of us think of him as a weak God. Maybe we wouldn't say that or verbalize that, but the way we live our life, is as if he's a weak God. That doesn't help us. That can't help us in our time of need. Yet the word says that this child, Jesus, would be this mighty God. And there are times in our life where we need Jesus as our mighty God. Who in here is going through something or has gone through something in your life that you just feel like you can't handle yourself? Every single person in their room could raise their hand. We get desperate at times, don't we? I've been there. We get desperate at times. There are some things that are ahead of us, some things that we are facing that we just can't face in ourselves, that it's just not in our power. And we looked at this verse last week, and I want to bring it back up this week. Paul tells us in Ephesians 6, 12, that we are not fighting against flesh and blood enemies, but against evil rulers and authorities of the unseen world, against mighty powers in this dark world and against evil spirits in the heavenly places. A lot of what we're facing here on earth is not necessarily uh, our enemy. It's coming from this spiritual place. We are fighting these, this, this, these spiritual enemies around us. And so when we're fighting them, what we have to understand is that we don't have power in ourselves to do anything in the spiritual realm. Not within ourselves. It doesn't originate with us. That's where we need our mighty God. Jesus. Who does have power and authority as we're going to look at today in all realms. On heaven and on earth. And we need him to fight for us. We need him to be our mighty God because there are times and situations in our life where only God can help. There are times when no human being can help us. Your terminal diagnosis, your, can't, your doctor can't help you with. The situation you're facing, your pastor can't counsel you through. No friend can help you when you're going through some things in your life and that often there's some things that we face in our in our lives and this is actually a lot of things that we can't even help ourselves yeah. right. where we're in need of someone who is mightier than us 
someone that will fight on our behalf, someone that can do the impossible. And we have access to that person, and his name is Jesus. So we're going to be in John chapter 11 today. I was trying to think, when do we see Jesus most clearly as this mighty God? And I figured him resurrecting someone who was dead would probably be the best one to look at. So we're going to be in John chapter 11 today. It's going to be a story that's familiar to a lot of you, and this is the story of Lazarus and Jesus. In John chapter 11, we find a situation where the people are desperate and in need of someone mighty and powerful, more powerful than themselves. And ultimately what they needed is someone that could give life itself. And we know that God is the one who gives life. So I got three points for you today about Jesus as our mighty God. And I got, I think, four points at the end about what we do in response. So let's talk about this first one. Our mighty God moves on behalf of his people. Our mighty God moves on behalf of his people. We, the church, are his people if we have come to faith in him and if we follow him. We are his people. And so I want to show you this from John chapter 11. Uh, We get some background information here, verses 1 through 3. There's a man named Lazarus, and he was sick. He lived in Bethany with his sisters, Mary and Martha. This is the Mary who had later poured the expensive perfume on Jesus' feet and wiped them with her hair. Her brother, Lazarus, was sick. So the two sisters sent a message to Jesus telling him, Lord, your dear friend is very sick. Lazarus is a dear friend of Jesus. Lazarus, Mary, and Martha are all dear friends of Jesus. He loves them all. And we're told here that Lazarus is very sick. And Mary and Martha are doing exactly what good friends should do. We should go to Jesus on behalf of the ones that we love when they're going through something tough. So they're in this situation. Lazarus is sick. They've gone to Jesus. But when Jesus heard about this in verse 4, he said... Lazarus' sickness will not end in death. No, it happened for the glory of God, so that the Son of God will receive glory from this. So Jesus, he said, and, so, and then it says, so although Jesus loved Martha, Mary, and Lazarus, he stayed where he was for the next two days. Jesus has already seen that Lazarus' sickness will not end in death. And he states the whole purpose for the whole situation. He says, this happened for the glory of God so that the Son of God will receive glory from this. But then he stays where he is for the next two days. You might be thinking, I thought this point was about how God moves on behalf of his people. And once you just read was that Jesus stayed where he was for the next two days. How often has this happened in your life where it seems like Jesus isn't moving on your behalf? How often has this happened in your life where things are just not working out the way you hoped they would? You thought this situation, this problem would have already been resolved by this point. It's almost as if Jesus is waiting for a couple days or waiting for an unknown amount of time uh, and not interested in helping you in your situation. I've been there. And the enemy will try to tell you that God doesn't care about you. In that waiting time, he'll try to make you believe that God is not working on your behalf. But we're going to see later why he waited those extra two days. We're going to see later those purpose in that, and there's purpose when he's waiting to move on your behalf as well. And ultimately, it's for your good. Ultimately, it's for the good of others as well. So finally, in in, uh, verse 7, we're told, he said to his disciples, let's go back to Judea. You know, when you're God, you can wait an extra two days, and it's not going to change the outcome. And so that's why Jesus is waiting an extra two days. Is this not going to change the outcome? Because Jesus is God and he can do whatever he wants to do when he wants to do it. So I want to tell you today, Jesus will always move towards the battle that we're facing. If you're in a battle, in a situation, if something has come up against you, I will tell you with confidence that Jesus will always move towards that battle. And because he's moving towards that battle, he's moving towards you. He's with you. Now, 
sometimes Jesus may move for us. He might take care of the situation. He might take care of the battle we're facing. He might, he might take the enemy out, whatever it may be. He might take care of the situation. But that doesn't happen all the time, at least the way we want it to. But Jesus will always move in us. Not always move for us, but he will always move in us. That's what he's doing with this waiting period with Lazarus and Mary and Martha. He's waiting so that ultimately the transformation that he wants to see happen within them will happen. He waits in our life so that we will grow. He waits so that the situation will become impossible so that we will see him get all the glory. That's what he's doing with Lazarus. He's waiting for Lazarus to be dead for a few days so that the situation seems impossible, yet he's going to move on their behalf. Jesus will always move according to his great wisdom. It does not always happen when we want it to. It doesn't always happen how we want it to. But we kind of covered this during our last series on suffering. We are to trust God through the whole process. We've got to trust in his wisdom. We've got to trust in him. So our mighty God moves on behalf of his people. Our mighty God is courageous. That's the second point for you today. Our mighty God is courageous. That word mighty, it's gonna, it means a few things, and we're kind of going through them today, and one of the meanings is courageous. This, our mighty God, when he prophesied, Isaiah prophesied about Jesus, he was saying that he was going to be courageous. And so we're told in John chapter 11, verses 7 through 10, finally he said to his disciples, let's go back to Judea. <clears throat> but his disciples objected. Rabbi, they said, only a few days ago, the people in Judea were trying to stone you. Are you going there again? And Jesus replied, there are 12 hours of daylight every day. During the day, people can walk safely. They can see because they have the light of this world. But at night, there's danger of stumbling because they have no light. His disciples are afraid. They said, are you kidding me, Jesus? We're going back to where they just tried killing you. They just tried stoning you. They just tried taking you out. And we're going back there? And Jesus, I love his response. It's a spiritual response. He's teaching them something. He's basically saying that, hey, while I'm still here, I am the light of the world. While I'm still here, we don't have time to let fear stop us. We don't have time to let fear stop us from doing what God has called us to do. And how often does fear stop us from doing what God has called us to do? So Jesus basically said, let's go. Then he said, our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep. But now I will go and wake him up. And the disciples said, Lord, if he is taking a nap, he'll get better. You know, we all get better after naps most of the time. They thought Jesus meant Lazarus was simply sleeping, but Jesus meant Lazarus had died. And so, like Jesus has to do with us sometimes, he has to tell us plainly, Lazarus is dead. And for your sakes, man, I'm glad I wasn't there, for now you will really believe. Come, let's go see him. So Thomas, nicknamed the twin, said to his fellow disciples, let's go to and die with Jesus. Thomas and the disciples think they're walking to their death, basically. But now I want to talk about that second statement from Jesus about, hey, Lazarus has died, but I'm going to go wake him up. That was pretty courageous to say, too. That was pretty bold of Jesus to state that he was going to resurrect Lazarus from the dead. He can say that because he's God. Jesus has nothing to be afraid of. Jesus has no reason to be afraid. He is God. He is the creator of this world. He has no reason to be fearful of anything. Because he made everything. How often has your battle scared you? You know, like I, I look at some things, I, I'll be honest with you. We probably have, we probably have record attendance today. If I had to guess. 
as our church continues to grow, the path ahead fears me as the leader of this church. Um, I realize the weight of the decisions we have to make, and and I take my job very seriously because I know some of the decisions I make, some of the things I preach affect your souls. I don't want anybody to miss heaven because of me. And so I, I see, I, I have this fear about what lies ahead of our church. It's a healthy fear, you know. It, it, I, I would say it's good. I, I went over some of the stats about our church with our leaders last Monday, and I thought everybody would be excited, you know. God's blessing us. And I looked in all their eyes, and there was fear. There was fear of what lies ahead. Yet, when I think about that, Jesus already knows what lies ahead. Maybe you've gotten a diagnosis from the doctor that put fear into you. It costs you to be afraid. Maybe someone has said something or done something to you that scared you. Many times our situations scare us, but they don't scare God. And I'm thankful that we as Christians have a mighty God that we can go to that does not act in fear. I'm thankful that we as Christians have a mighty God that we can go to that has a different perspective on our situation. And he's not afraid. Because, you know, when you're afraid, you can make some bad decisions. When you're afraid, you can make some decisions that are not wise. But we can lean into our wise counselor. He will give us his wisdom if we ask him for it. Jesus is courageous. Whatever's facing you today, it does not scare him. And so we can go to him. We can receive help from him. So our mighty God moves on behalf of his people. Our mighty God is courageous. The third one is our mighty God is powerful. Powerful. When Jesus arrived at Bethany, he was told that Lazarus, had already been in his grave for four days. I can imagine Jesus, he already knew this, obviously, but Jesus, I'm thinking, he's thinking, great. Four days. Because they believed that when someone died, their soul would kind of float around the body for a few days, waiting to return to it. And so people... The family of the one who died would stay around the tomb for three days, waiting to see just in case they came back to life. But by the fourth day, the person who died uh, would officially be declared dead because their soul would have moved on. This is why Jesus waited the extra two days, is so that it reached that four days. So that they knew for a fact that the soul was gone. Jesus intentionally waited so that his power could be displayed. So that when Jesus would move on their behalf, he would be doing the impossible. Sometimes he waits for our situation to get worse so that then he can move. And we know the doctors didn't help us. Our pastor didn't help us. It was not our friends. It was not ourselves. It could only have been God. We're real bad about giving credit to doctors, giving credit to, to people of this world when we should be giving credit to our mighty God who moves on behalf of his people, who is courageous, who is powerful, who can make the cancer disappear, who can make things happen if we believe. I want to tell a story from Luke chapter 8, and we're going to read it. But this is a, a good picture of what Jesus can do. Because often the storms we face in our life, they look powerful. But they're nothing compared to the power of Jesus. And here in Luke chapter 8, as the disciples and Jesus are sailing across a, a lake, a storm comes up. It says, as they sailed across, Jesus settled down for a nap. But soon a fierce storm came down on the lake. The boat was filling with water. And they were in real danger. The disciples, they went and they woke him up shouting, Master, Master, we're going to drown. When Jesus woke up, he rebuked the wind and the raging waves. Suddenly the storm stopped and all was calm. 
He can do that in your life too. There he has power over the literal wind and waves, but he has power over the figurative wind and waves facing you today as well. And so there are times where a storm is facing us and, you know, we're scared to death. We're, Jesus, wake up! Wake up, Jesus! And Jesus knows everything going on, so, you know, you don't need to wake him up. But in our fear, we're freaking out wanting him to move on our behalf. Sometimes he will wake up and he will, move, he, will, he will calm the wind and the waves. In fact, we're told in Matthew 28, 18, this is when Jesus is given the Great Commission, he told the disciples, I have been given all authority in heaven and on earth. All authority has been given to Jesus, our mighty God, and he will wield his power and his authority on our behalf because he loves you. Because he cares about you. He cares about what you're facing. He will do that for us as our mighty God. As our mighty God that we serve. He will work in you and he will work for you. But there is a key. And this is where we miss it. I might be preaching this today and you might be saying, Well, I've never seen Jesus move on my behalf like that. I've never seen Jesus do something like that for me. Because there's a key to unlocking this. And the key is this. You've got to look to Jesus. You've got to look to Jesus. How often do we do the exact opposite? Jesus was not happy with his disciples for waking him up from his nap. He's like my wife in the morning probably. He was not, yeah, thank you, David. Old man wisdom right there, so I'm just going to stop. I might be playing basketball this evening, so I might not even be with you. Uh, <laughs> uh, surprise. Uh, Jesus woke up and he said, where is your faith? And here's the reason why he's rebuking them It's because a few verses later, at the beginning of this story, in verse 22, he told his disciples, let's cross to the other side of the lake. So they got in the boat and they started out. Jesus said, we're going to the other side of the lake. A storm comes up. His disciples are afraid. His disciples are saying, Jesus, you better wake up. We're going to drown. When Jesus wakes up, he says, where's your faith, guys? Listen, I said we're going to the other side of the lake. So it does not matter what storm comes against you. It doesn't matter what storm comes into your life. It doesn't matter if you think you're about to drown. It doesn't matter what is facing you. You're going to make it to the other side of the lake because Jesus said you would. See, the disciples seem to have thought during that moment that the storm was more powerful than their God. How often have we felt the same way? Well, we're facing this storm, and we're so afraid of this storm that we forget we have a mighty God who fights on behalf of his people. And that nothing's going to happen to me that he doesn't want, that he doesn't allow. Going back to our last series, what faces you has gone through his hand. And sometimes he allows times of tribulation to test us so that our faith proves genuine and grows us. And ultimately, here's what happened with the disciples. We're told in the second part of verse 25, they were afraid and amazed who is this man they asked when he gives a command even the winds and the waves obey him their fear of the storm turned into a fear of god you know if i was the disciples i would have felt really bad at that moment that i realized that i was more afraid of the storm that i gave the storm too much credit i gave satan too much credit when jesus was on my boat 
And if Jesus is on my boat, everything's going to work out fine in the long run. Are you looking at your storm this morning? When you should be looking to your mighty God? Are you looking in fear at the storm or the battle? Trying to figure out what you need to do? And God is wanting you to look to him. The picture that came in my head when I was writing this was that so often it's like our boat's filling up with water and we're over here with buckets trying to get, get the water out, you know. That's a losing battle. When we should look to Jesus. When we should look to our mighty God. And if he's told us, like he told the disciples, we're going to the other side of the lake, we better believe it. He's the God of promises. He's faithful to his promises. And we need to know that. Martha, going back to our Lazarus story, Martha had the right idea of looking to Jesus. So when Martha got the word, this is verse 20 and 21, when Martha got the word that Jesus was coming, she went to meet him. Great job, Martha. You're going, you're looking to Jesus. But Mary stayed in the house. Mary is not responding the way she should, and it gets worse from here. Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if only you had been here, my brother would not have died. Now that statement does not seem that great. But what she does next, and we're going to give you the point, and then we'll look at the verse, she does look to Jesus in faith. It's not as simple as looking to Jesus. We've got to look in faith. Look in faith. Let's see how Martha looked in faith. So she looked to Jesus. She's gone to Jesus. And she said, if you had only been here, my brother would not have died. But then she has a second part of that statement. But even now, I know that God will give you whatever you ask. That's faith right there, church. That's faith. That's her knowing the storm is bad. Knowing the battle is tough. Knowing that this seems impossible but nothing is impossible for her god nothing is impossible for our mighty god in jesus and so she's looking at him in faith but mary poor mary she doesn't 10 verses later verse 32 when mary arrived and saw jesus she fell at his feet and said lord if only you had been here my brother would not have died she did not follow up with what Martha followed up with. And because she didn't, and hear me clearly, church, because she didn't speak in faith, because she didn't act in faith, because she didn't look to Jesus in faith, she missed what Jesus had said to Martha. Martha made that statement in verse 22 where she says, even now I know that God will give you whatever you ask. And so here's what Jesus reveals to her. He says, your brother will rise again. And Martha says, yeah, I know he will. He'll rise when everybody else rises at the last day. But Jesus told her, I am the resurrection and the life. Anyone who believes in me will live even after dying. Everyone who lives in me and believes in me will never, ever die. Do you believe this, Martha? Yes, Lord, she told him. I've always believed you are the Messiah. You are the one that Isaiah prophesied about that we're reading right now. She knew that he was this mighty God. And with him, anything was possible. I've always believed you're the Messiah, the Son of God, the one who has come into the world from God. See, Martha spoke in faith, and Jesus revealed himself as the resurrection and the life. Jesus revealed his power even over death. Mary missed that because she didn't look to him in faith. Now, she's getting ready to see it in action. 
but she missed that revelation because of her lack of faith. And I wonder, church, what revelations have we missed because of our lack of faith? What have we missed that God wanted to reveal to us or do for us or do in us because we didn't look to him in faith? Looking to Jesus in doubt does no good. When you're looking to Jesus in doubt, I want you to hear how bad this is. You're looking to him and basically saying, I don't think you are who you say you are. I don't think you are this mighty God that has power. I don't think you're this mighty God that is courageous. I don't think you are who you say you are. That's dangerous territory, church, when you're looking at the Son of God, when you're looking at Jesus with doubt. Saying, I, I don't think you can work in this situation, Jesus. My doctor said the cancer... It's going to take me out. I don't think you can heal me. What's going on in my head, Jesus? I don't think you can help me, Will. The state of my life, of my relationships right now, Jesus, this is impossible. There's no hope. When you look to Jesus in doubt, you can limit his work in your life. Example of this is in Jesus' hometown. They look to him with unbelief, and we're told in Mark 6, 5, because of their unbelief, he couldn't do any miracles among them except to place his hands on a few sick people and heal them. Now, I love that this says, except, place his hands on a few sick people and heal them. Like, just, let's just brush over that, that. Yeah, he healed a few people. But the point here is that because of their unbelief, they missed out on some of the things that Jesus wanted to do. Because of your unbelief, you can miss out on some of the things that God wants to do in your life and through your life. But so often we look at him in doubt because the circumstances of life get us down. The storm seems so strong, the battle seems like it's going to end in defeat. And so we look at him with this doubt because of our circumstances, because of our storm. Yet we must look to him as our mighty God in faith. Catch this. Believing his word over our worries. Looking to his might rather than our mess being a Martha rather than a Mary. What situation are you facing today that you need to look to your mighty God in faith? Some of you may be experiencing something that you cannot overcome yourself. The enemy has thrown something at you that is designed to take you out, and you can't fight it off yourself because it's just not in your power. And at this point, you need Jesus. But you don't need this fluffy version of Jesus that we often portray in church, in movies, in pictures. You don't need this fluffy version of Jesus that we think that is all about this, oh, hey there, sweetie. No, what you need is Jesus to be your mighty God, which means a few things. The word mighty here, we've already went over some of them, means strength, power, courageous. But two more I want to close with, and the first one is this, warrior. There are times in your life when the situation seems so hard, the situation seems so tough, the storm seems like you're never going to make it through, the battle seems so hard that you need to look to your mighty warrior. You need to look to our warrior God. Jesus is our warrior. Revelation 19, 11, Jesus is not come back, this fluffy version that we often portray in the church. Here's how he's going to come back. John says, I saw heaven open and a white horse was standing there and its rider was named Faithful and True for he judges fairly and he wages a righteous war. 
He's a warrior. He's a warrior. And we're in a war right now. You might be in a battle, but we're in a war. We're all in a war, and the battles you're facing are just part of this war. And Jesus is currently fighting in this war on our behalf. In fact, he's already won the victory. He's already done what he needs to do. He's just going to finalize it when he returns as this warrior God that we sometimes need to call on in the midst of our situation, the midst of our storm. And so here you see Mary and Martha going to their warrior God. Their brother has just died. They need their warrior God to come and fight on their behalf. And I see it. This is the first time I've read this passage. And I've seen Jesus as this warrior God. Let's read John eleven thirty three. When Jesus saw her weeping and saw the other people welling with her, a deep anger welled up within him. And he was deeply troubled. This is the first time that I've really connected that anger to Jesus as our warrior God. Jesus came to this scene of people basically having a funeral weeping, crying, mourning for the loss of their dear friend. And Jesus, rather than going over there to comfort them and say, I'm sorry for your loss, as we do, Jesus instead is angry. The warrior in him is coming out. Why is he angry? It's because he sees death and ultimately he sees sin and its effects the wages of sin is death and Jesus never desired for us to experience any of that and so Jesus is angry as he sees this scene he sees one of his enemies death and so he said, where have you put them? They told him, Lord, come and see. Then Jesus wept. Range of emotions there, and we get mad when we have a range of emotions, but he's angry one second. Now he's weeping. But he's so bothered by what he sees at this scene. And the people who were standing nearby said, see how much he loved them. But some said, this man killed a blind man. Couldn't he have kept Lazarus from dying? It's lack of faith there from whoever's saying that. But now we're told in verse 38, Jesus was still angry. So he was angry, he cried, now he's angry. He, he continues to be angry. And he arrived at the tomb, a cave with a stone rolled across its entrance. And I've re I read this differently this time. He says, roll the stone aside like a warrior getting ready for battle. Get this, roll this stone to the side. But Martha, the dead man's sister, she, she's lost her faith at this point. She said, Lord, he's been dead for four days. The smell is going to be terrible. And I read this part differently. Jesus responded, remember, he's angry. Didn't I tell you that you would see God's glory if you believe. I don't know if he read it that way, but I know he's angry at this, the scene of this tomb. And when I'm angry, I say stuff like that. Didn't I tell you, and there's nothing wrong with him saying that, didn't I tell you that you would see God's glory if you believe? He hates this scene. He hates everything going on here. He hates to see death. Why? Because death was a result of sin is not a part of his original desire for us. And so what we're about to see right here is our warrior God, Jesus, go to war against death for Lazarus. This thought came to me. I'm going to say it and then I'm going to talk about it. Jesus will oppose anything that opposes him. Jesus though doesn't choose to oppose anyone, we choose to oppose him. Let me show you a few examples. 
Jesus didn't choose to oppose Satan. Satan's the one who rebelled and chose to oppose him. Jesus doesn't choose to oppose us. Because of our sin, we have chosen to oppose him. Paul says, while we were still sinners, while we were still enemies of God. Let me read James 4, 4. James used strong language here. He says, you adulterers. Don't you realize that friendship with the world makes you an enemy of God? I say it again. If you want to be a friend of the world, you make yourself an enemy of God. You've chosen your side in this grand war. If you choose to be on the world side, if you choose to live in the ways of the world, you choose to be an enemy of God. Jesus doesn't say, hey, I'm picking you as my enemy. You're going to be 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 my enemy. No, you've chosen that side. Luckily for us, Jesus loves even his enemies, and so that's where Paul comes in in Romans where he says, while we were Christ's enemies, he still died for us. He made a way for us to switch sides. And so Jesus, he will oppose, I heard a, a great sermon series from a church in Ashboro, uh, uh, the name of it was Opposed by God. And one of the things that uh, they talked about was when we choose to sin, Jesus will oppose us. God will oppose us so that hopefully we correct ourselves and turn back to him. So that, that was interesting. But luckily, Jesus loves his enemies and wants to see us reconciled to him. So he died for us so that we could switch teams, so that we could switch sides. But Jesus' ultimate enemy is sin and all of its consequences, including death. That's Jesus' ultimate enemy. It's not Satan. It's sin. The trials we face in our life, the storms you're facing in your life, they're a result of living in a sinful, fallen world. I got good news for you. We won't have them in heaven. Jesus hates that we have to experience what we experience here on earth because of the fall, because Adam and Eve sinned pushed us out from what God originally desired for us. And as we continue to sin, we continue to bring evil into this world. We continue to produce evil from within ourselves. And instead, we need to choose to follow him. So what Jesus does is he opposes some of the results of sin, like the suffering we experience here on earth. He will fight on your behalf sometimes. That's why he will fight for us as our warrior God. He will bring healing. He will bring hope. He brings help in our time of need and we like it when he does that sometimes he does not oppose our suffering because he needs to he needs to help us defeat our ultimate enemy and his ultimate enemy which is sin jesus ultimately has waged a war against sin and all of its results he does not just focus on the battles we face as a result of living in a sinful, fallen world. No, he has focused on winning the war against sin itself. And that's where we get to our last meaning of the word mighty. He has won the war against sin itself, therefore he is our hero. The word mighty means hero. So when you look to your warrior God to fight your battles, who moves on your behalf, who is courageous, who is powerful, he'll become your hero. So look to our hero. Jesus is our hero because he's won the war. He has won the war against sin. Romans 6.10, here's what Paul says. When he died, talking about Jesus, he died once to break the power of sin. But now that he lives, he lives for the glory of God. Jesus has broken the power of sin. So you might be thinking, well, if he broke the power of sin, why do we still live like sin has power? He's broken the power and he's going to win the war when he returns. But he's given us, as our mighty God, he has given us the ability to not live under the power of sin anymore. He's broken the power of sin and its consequences in death. 
we can have eternal life, but we have to choose to make him our mighty God who fights on our behalf. We choose to make his victories our victories. We choose to fall under him. We choose to follow him, get on his team. We choose not to be an enemy of him. But how often do we choose instead to, in, to sin? How often we choose to give in to the power of sin that Jesus has already broken, that Jesus has already taken care of, yet we choose so often to say, you know what, I'm still going to be a slave to sin. And Paul says very clearly in Romans 6, don't be a slave to sin, be a slave to God. Be a slave to our mighty God who fights on our behalf, who has already given us the victory over sin. I didn't hit on this as much as I wanted to. I'm going to go back. We want God so often to, to fight our battles, to fight our storms, to fight whatever we're facing. We want him to take care of it. But there are times in our life where he doesn't take care of us because he wants us to take care of sin. There are times where he does not take the, the storm away, the battle away, whatever it may be, because he wants to use it to break us down so that we look to him as our mighty God that has overcome the power of sin, and we can call on that power, call on that authority, and live lives that glorify him in everything that we do. Yet so often we just focus, hey, hey, Thank you, Jesus, so I don't have to die. When I die, I'm going to have eternal life. Listen, he's broken the power of sin for this life. Sin no longer has power over you. Therefore, you don't have to say yes to it. You can choose to say yes to God. You can choose to say yes to Jesus in your life. That's the holiness message that I'm always going to preach here in this church. He desires for us to live a holy life because he loves us. And our warrior God has fallen on our behalf for us to, to live in that right. He's given us the victory. So let's go to John eleven forty one through 44. They rolled the stone aside. Jesus looked up to heaven and said, Father, I thank you for hearing me. You always hear me, but I said it out loud for the sake of all these people standing here so that they will believe that you sent me. Then Jesus shouted, Lazarus, come out. That's a warrior shouting that right there. That's a warrior Announcing death's defeat. And the dead man came out, his hands and feet bound in grave clothes, his face wrapped in a headcloth, and Jesus told them, unwrap this man and let him go. Jesus became the hero in that situation. He became the hero for Lazarus, he became the hero for Martha, he became the hero for Mary, and he can be your hero today. If you look to him, he will be your hero no matter what the outcome is of the battle that you are currently in. If, even if your battle, even if your diagnosis, even if your storm ends in death, he will still give you the victory. Why? Because he's already won the war. Death has been defeated. Sin has been overcome. And so ultimately Jesus doesn't just want us to win the battles we face. He wants us to win the war as well. So sometimes he allows the battles to knock us down so that the long game is played, so that we win the war. As our hero, he's made it possible for us to win the war. He's made it possible for us to live free from the power of sin. He has made it possible for us to live eternally with him. But you have to look to him. You have to look to him in faith, believing he is the Son of God. You've got to choose to not be his enemy. He opposes those who oppose him, and if you choose to oppose him, if you choose to play for the other team, if you choose to be on the other side, there's bad news for you when he returns. But he loves you so, so much, church. That he made a way for you to come to him. And so you have to look to him and make him your God today. 
You have to follow him. Romans 6.11, this is right after that verse I read, he tells the Roman church, so you also should consider yourselves to be dead to the power of sin and alive to God through Christ Jesus. We do not consider ourselves most of the time dead to the power of sin. We should, though. We live as if sin still has power over us. But he has made a way for us, and when you follow him, he becomes your hero. And so you will see him be your mighty God who fights on your behalf and becomes your hero. And here's what 1 John 5, 4 says. Every child of God defeats this evil world, and we achieve this victory through our faith. Every child of God defeats this evil world. I zeroed in on this verse because the evil world, that's a lot included in there, isn't it? The battles you're facing as a result of living in this evil fallen world, that falls in there. So what this says there, every child of God, everyone that chooses to follow him, they're going to, ultimately the the devil's not going to accomplish what he wants to accomplish through whatever storm he's faced at you because he wants that storm to take you out. He wants that storm to stop you from following God. But if you choose to look to Jesus, look, look to our mighty God, you're going to defeat the enemy in that battle. But also included in that is the ultimate battle, the ultimate war with sin. Every child of God defeats this evil world and we achieve victory through our King Jesus, through our mighty God who fights on behalf of his people. But you've got to look to him. Stand to your feet. I want every head bowed and every eye closed.